Sure. Um, well, the quick summary is it's warming, it's us, we're sure, it's bad, and we can fix it. So that's what science tells us. That's what science has been telling us for a very long time. Um, what's becoming more and more clear is just how bad it is and how very far away current policies are from where they need to be to get us in line with the Paris Agreement. I wrote this book starting from conversations that I had with friends from college who a few years ago were starting to really wake up to the climate crisis. And in a way, it was strange because these are some of my closest friends and we have been through many ups and downs in our lives, divorce and the death of a spouse to cancer and big life changes. But we hadn't talked that much about the climate crisis. So I think it had kind of reached this um, urgency or tipping point for them where they had been aware of it, but maybe avoiding it for a long time and knew that it was something I worked with, you know, on a daily basis in my work and research. But we hadn't really spent much time talking about it. So basically, I wanted to write a book for uh, people like my friends who are aware of the climate crisis, know that it's happening, are concerned, and then don't really know how they can be a part of the solution, how they can fit into um, helping make it better, what needs to be done and who can do what, and trying to make this feel actionable and um, give people energy to contribute where they can. It's about facing the climate crisis with facts, feelings, and action. So in a couple chapters at the beginning, I lay out the facts and summarize the research, how we know that it's warming, what the consequences are, why it's so urgent that we leave fossil fuels in the ground and switch to sustainable agriculture so that we actually succeed in stabilizing the climate. Um, because the climate and biodiversity crises are linked, so I, I talk about the root causes of both of those. And then in the middle, I uh, talk about feelings, which is a more personal section. I mean, the whole book is written from my own experience and combining my own uh, stories and experiences with the research that I've conducted and that many, many others have conducted. So I wanted to read as accessible and it's actually been recommended for uh, middle school kids, so ages 12 and up. So uh, I think it is um, easy to understand. But the middle section is about feelings um, like grief and sadness at the loss of people and places and species that we love that are being harmed because of climate change. Facing that grief, I think, is a way to um, build community and acknowledge what's important and focus on the urgency. Um, anger is another chapter because there is so much injustice about climate change. And I think um, acknowledging that and finding ways to address that is really important. And then the third section is all about how we can fix it, the concrete actions, both on a personal and household level for people like me who are in the group of high emitters who need to reduce our overconsumption, but also how we can come together in communities um, and change systems of politics and power and money and culture to actually have a stable climate. My original interest is rooted in my love of nature and being outside. I grew up in a really beautiful place um, north of San Francisco in California and spent a lot of time hiking in the hills and the mountains and um, really enjoying being outside and spending time in nature. Um, and increasingly, it feels like a, a responsibility or really a calling and an obligation. I mean, um, those of us who have this knowledge and help to create this knowledge and spread this knowledge, it can't just stay in the ivory tower. It's so important that it gets out and reaches a critical mass uh, big enough to make a difference. In a study a few years ago that was led by Seth Wines, we looked at the personal lifestyle changes that make the biggest difference for the climate. And what we found is that for high emitters to quickly reduce our own climate pollution, the big life choices are to go car, flight, and meat free. So those are where I've focused my own efforts. Um, the biggest change that I've made was to go from being a recovering frequent flyer. So in 2010, I took actually 15 round trip flights. 
um, which I realize now puts me in this very small elite group of frequent flyers, which is 1% of the population that cause 50% of climate pollution from flying. So I've given up my frequent flying I've, and reduced my flying about 90%, and that made the biggest difference to reduce my emissions. I was also able to go car free when I moved from California to Sweden, which has, um, I was able to live centrally in a city so I can walk or bike to work and there's good bus and train infrastructure for mobility. And uh, I have also gone meat free, which is uh, the smallest difference in terms of absolute emission savings, but also really important for biodiversity and saving land and other resources. So those are some of the changes I've made. I think the biggest, um, my experience has been the, the hardest part was getting started and making the decision. And it helped me to make um, some clear decisions like, okay, I'm gonna stop flying within Europe, which is a decision I made in 2012. And that actually freed up so much time and energy. I hadn't expected that to be the case, but I think I had been wasting a lot of time sort of agonizing over each and every individual decision and inspired by a friend of mine who had done the same kind of adopting this, um, this kind of border or rule for myself that set some boundaries made it so much easier to make decisions. And uh, I think one unexpected benefit was romance. So on my fourth date with my husband, we went to Paris by train, which was a 15 hour train trip. And um, I thought this will never work and we'll get sick of each other. And, you know, but at least we'll I'll filter him out. So he gets used to me, you know, he knows what he's getting into right away. But actually we had a wonderful time. We've taken many train adventures since, and I think it's a, a good relationship test. So I can recommend train travel for many reasons. Yeah, absolutely. And this is reflected both by research that studies uh, people who have made behavior changes and also from stories and personal experience. I think of my friend and colleague, Kim Cobb, who's a climate scientist in the U.S. And she started biking to work, uh, I think, 14 years ago and has just been astounded at what a huge difference it makes to her health, to her energy. Um, so something that she thought would be a sacrifice and she started off doing it a very on a very limited basis has actually become one of her favorite parts of the day and something she treasures and looks forward to and i think often thinking ahead and trying to imagine something new is really difficult but making changes can have all these unexpected benefits and i think one big point that i make in the book is trying to focus on our priorities and values and what really matters to you and why and figuring out ways to what I call maximize meaning and minimize carbon. So how can I have, you know, adventure if that's what's important to me in a low carbon way? Or how can I, you know, live where I want and also be able to get to work and get kids to school or get where I need to go in a low carbon way? So sort of thinking about um, the whole system of our lives and the areas where we do have the options to make choices can make a really big difference. We actually need both personal and systemic change. Um, and systemic change obviously affects everyone. The folks who need to make the personal changes are people like me who are in the top 10% of income and therefore emissions. And we're in this group that's responsible for half of household climate pollution. So we're actually a globally major source of emissions. And we know from science that to stabilize the climate, we actually have to get carbon emissions all the way down to zero. So that means we have to stop the production and consumption of fossil fuels. And for those of us who are in this high emitting uh, group, we actually do need to reduce our overconsumption to enable that transition to happen. But for everybody, we also need to be getting together and making political and policy demands, changing how we, um, the financial incentives, the rules of industry. So there definitely are system changes that need to be made. And I would say if you're, currently at an emissions level that's close to the average for your country, then making personal lifestyle changes maybe doesn't need to be your personal focus and you can dive right in and focus only on the system change. But if you're in this high emitting group, you actually do need to lead by example and you have the opportunity to quickly reduce a lot of emissions.
It does matter. And that's been really encouraging to see from research. So one of um, I have a current project called the takeoff of staying on the ground, which is looking at this social movement that has started in Sweden and is spreading elsewhere for people who are choosing to dramatically reduce or completely stop flying because of the climate crisis and recognizing that this is, um, you know, we can't fly the way that we have been to have a stable climate. So um, some colleagues looked or interviewed about 700 people who had made this decision in Sweden. And it's very interesting to have now a few of these studies that actually look at people who have made the change. So it's not just speculating about what, you know, what would happen if X, Y, and Z, but actually what did happen um, as looking back on real data. And so what we see is that people do influence each other and they are influenced by the people around them. And there's a similar study from Steve Westlake in the UK that has shown that people who know someone who has stopped flying or flies less and importantly talks about it and has conversations about it does significantly reduce the flying of people around them. So that is how behavior change actually starts to spread. And it's also how we start changing not just behavior, but also norms and attitudes, what's expected and desired and what we're aiming for and see as cool and important. And those kind of cultural changes are also really important. So it does make a big difference. So for our own personal household emissions, the biggest sources are from planes, cars, and meat. So those are where we need to focus our efforts to reduce our own household and personal emissions. question has two parts. I mean, I think first the personal part for me, which is really important, is about taking care of myself and the people around me and getting enough sleep and exercise and, you know, the basic things that your mom <laughs> would tell you to do um, that we all know what basically is healthy for us, but easier said than done. But I think those things are really important to um, keep ourselves healthy and energized. And especially in the time of the pandemic, that's a big challenge, but both physically and mentally healthy and well, and doing the things that make us feel good, those are really important. Um, so I try to keep up with those. And then I think that's on a personal level. And that I think is linked with um, something I read about, which I call the five stages of radical climate acceptance, which is basically recognizing that often there's a pattern to how we face the climate crisis and going from ignorance to avoidance to this feeling of doom. And that that is a phase that we can actually get through if we go through the fourth stage, which is all the feels. So by acknowledging and finding ways to honor and tolerate all these uncomfortable feelings, we can actually get to the fifth stage, which is purpose. And I think that's a way that we can make use of the current climate crisis as a crucible to help us build community and create meaning because basically we happen to be alive at this incredibly important critical time for humanity where we have so much power and we'll have so much influence over what life on earth looks like for the rest of our lives and really the rest of human civilization. So it's a huge responsibility. But I think just to, to wrap up about hope, um, I think I like what Greta Thunberg says, that hope follows action, and I've found that to be true. So I think we don't need to wait around to have the right feelings of hope. We can start acting and doing the things that we know need to be done. And um, we see positive ripples from that work start to spill out and attract then more people who also want to do something but haven't gotten involved yet and encourage them to become involved and support each other. So I think by building that community is a really important way to, you know, keep each other's spirits up and, and help each other keep going. Mm -hmm.